Okay. So this uh, discussion is meant to be as informal as possible. This explains the presence of wine and champagne. And uh, you are <coughs> should feel free to intervene whenever you like. We like to be interrupted, at least uh, in a civilized way. And uh, that actually reminds me this kind of medieval uh, monastery thing that you know, it was a tradition that while people were, by monks were eating and drinking, you know, they had some kind of reading or some intellectual background. So this is our aim. Uh, we discussed what could be the topic of this um, discussion and decided finally that a uh, reasonable and well-justified topic could be the role of journals in the philosophy of history. And this, at least for two, two reasons. First, we have this unique opportunity here. Uh, we have three editor-in-chief of historical philosophical journals, be it former or current or, or in the future. And of course, secondly, as you all remember, this very conference is organized also to mark the move of, of the Journal of the Philosophy of History from, from Hronigan to, to Oulu. So I think <coughs> this largely justifies our choice of the topic. And I've prepared a few points we would discuss, but as said, we very much count on your uh, contribution feedback as well. I won't introduce long, uh, the, the speaker, except that, uh, as you might know, Frank Angersmith is the founder and former editor-in-chief, current senior editor of Journal of the Philosophy of History. <coughs> Kalle Bichlanen is the acting co editor-in-chief of the Rethinking History Journal, and Jouni Matti Kukkanen is the new editor-in-chief of the Journal of Philosophy of History. Myself, Marek Tam, and uh, uh, I'm also a new member of the new editorial board of the Journal of the Philosophy of History. But I propose let's start by describing the current <coughs> landscape of of historical philosophical journals, at least in the English-speaking world, and to situate ourselves, to situate our respective journals in this field, and maybe also to explain briefly, especially in the case of the Journal of the Philosophy of History, the reasons why uh, uh, to found yet another journal in the field. And of course, it makes sense to start by Frank to tackle this question, please. <coughs> well, um if you survey the field, there are, as far as I would say, uh, five major journals. So history and theory, we think in history. And then you have Clio, an American journal, which focuses very strongly on literature, but nevertheless, sometimes you have a few things about uh, philosophy history. Uh, and then you have Storia della Storiografia. And then lastly, uh, but not easily, I should add, <laughs> the Journal of the Philosophy of History. Um, well, what made me begin with the um, Journal of Philosophy of History is roughly the following. Um, it has a lot to do with the broadening of the reflection of history around, uh, well, the beginning of this millennium. Uh, as you will probably all know, uh, philosophy history tended to be fairly restricted in the sense that its main focus always was on uh, well, how, what is historical knowledge and how can we know the past uh, and uh, what kind of varieties are there to acquire knowledge of the past. <coughs> and then somewhere uh, it already started I would say in Germany with the historical strides, with all the discussions about uh, memory, following up from uh, uh, Nora's uh, Lieu de Mémoire, then a whole set of other issues, more than I could enumerate here, came to the surface, all having in common the question, how do we relate to the past? So that was the new issue that came up at the end of the 1990s, not so much the issue of how can we know the past, in what way can history be seen as, well, one more, uh, empirical historical science, 
but the more existential phenological question how does the past present and what does the past mean to us and how should we give expression to our relationship to the past. Now I said you had these uh, five, uh, uh, these four uh, well-known journals already and um, they, diff they, they, they reacted to it in a different way. The reaction of uh, history and theory is more or less and that I can understand quite well, is that they said simply, well, uh, we are, and they were generally recognized, uh, the journal with the best reputation. They existed already since 1960, so had a long history. Uh, they did, had been doing exceptionally well. That was a success story. Uh, so they could be sure that anyone writing an essay on well, uh, the reflection on history would preferably have it published in history and theory. So they could be sure they got everything and also including especially the best things. So what I gathered, I'm not sure whether I'm right about this, is that the editors of history and theory primarily thought what are the best things that, uh, that we get in, whatever their topic is, are they on the issue of historical knowledge, do, do these deal with all these new topics, if it's a wonderful article and it uh, uh, surveys, it, it's a proposed new, uh, new uh, uh, avenues of thought, then we should take it. That had one advantage, the advantage was that therefore up to now, if you want to know and have an idea of well, all what happens in philosophy history and reflection on the past, then look at philosophy history. That was the big advantage and why still now journal of history is the journal that everyone should uh, uh, um, keep informed about. Uh, the disadvantage was <coughs> that this um, um, well, could lead to a certain amount of disintegration in the sense that uh, uh, history and theory now abandons its possibility of guiding discussion in one region or other. It was more uh, a, a receptacle for what came in than a, uh, a vehicle for we wish to go into that direction. And this is something that uh, I found very important. Since I have always felt I'm, it has to do with the fact that I'm a philosopher, both a historian and a philosopher by training, that I was always interested in the rarely purely philosophical issues occasioned by historical writing. That's what I wanted to know about. That's what I've always been written about, written about, and I therefore believed that there should be room for a journal that addressed these issues now that they, under the present circumstances, uh, well, were left standing somewhere alone or um, uh, without a specific support from the side of uh, uh, journal of the, from, of, from, uh, from, from history and theory. So that's what made me decide to uh, begin in 2005 uh, with the Journal of uh, the Philosophy of History. Of course, it took a few years, uh, two years, be uh, well, to get uh, actually started. For I can tell you that beginning a journal, uh, Avi was right, right from the beginning, so he can confirm my story. It's not a very simple thing. It takes some work, but in the end, we got working and the first issue appeared in uh, 2007. Well, even then we had a few difficult years, especially with regard to uh, finding sufficient uh, uh, quality submissions. But then, so roughly from, <laughs> from 2000, 2010, uh, well, it started to run smoothly, uh, and uh, we got in Scopus, we got them in, uh, in Reuters, which seemed to be uh, uh, to uh, uh, 
a kind of uh, denomination that's very important for, for journals. <coughs> and uh, so it went on until 2015, 2016. And then, well, I came to touch with uh, Jan Kuhn when I thought that the time had come for me to uh, hand my chief uh, editorship over to somebody else. And then I was happy to find uh, Jan Kuhn for, as I have explained on several occasions, I simply knew there was no better person to take it over from me than Jan. Okay, thank you. Maybe, maybe then Conley can open uh, his perspective, at least from the uh, current position to this landscape. And of course, you were you're not you were not part of the founding story of the real thinking history, but still, maybe you have some uh, knowledge about the reasons why this real thinking history journal was founded and what was its position in this field. Mm -hmm. I can try at least. I mean, I've been acting editor since June, but I have been. Uh, closely involved in the work of Rethinking History for some years. It's, I think it was uh, founded in 1997, after Keith Jen soon after Keith Jenkins' book with the same title came out, Rethinking History. And uh, originally Ratledge asked Keith to set up the journal. And uh, he went to them with some candidates because he didn't want to be an editor. And uh, Alan Munslow finally started it off. And very soon Robert Rosenstone came as the second founding editor. So from very Beginning, I think the um, main intention has to be has been to focus on historical writing and what problems there might be involved in historical writing. And with Robert Rosenstone already from the beginning, this idea of experimental history or creative writing, doing something different from traditional academic history writing, has been one of the leading the sort of main themes. And I think the other theme has been just to look at <coughs> popular forms of history culture alongside this sort of public memory these kind of monuments, that kind of stuff, but it's not as as much visible, I think, in the journal. And uh, now that Patrick Finney, Patrick Finney is, is the co-editor in the UK with me, and then we still have uh, James Goodman as one of the editors in America, who still focuses on this creative writing, and he's in charge of one issue a year on creative writing. I don't know how, mm -hmm. I just realized I've spoken to a few people and they hadn't realized that we've had a creative writing issue almost every year the first one each year, so maybe it hasn't had made, made the impact that we thought. But uh, it's still going strong, and there are interesting experiments, I think, all the time. But so, my interest is more in theory of history, strictly in terms of historical writing, or has been so far, and questions of how affect, exp experience, and other things like that appear in the writing itself. So not venturing too far beyond beyond the actual work that academic historians do because I don't find myself qualified to talk about history culture broadly at the moment. And uh, Patrick Finney has uh, focused very much on memory studies and uh, history of World War II, so he has that, that side of things much more dear to his heart, but he's also a theorist. Um, to, me, food, you, to me, we have uh, a very clear Frank was profile in a way. But, uh, those kind of... Um, not that easy relations with history and theory, uh, but what really think of history, how to you situate yourself vis-a-vis -vis of this old major old journal. <laughs> uh, I have to say I've never thought about this myself. Um, okay. I think the one thing that will come up is that uh, we're very reliant, as Frank was saying about history and theory, we're very reliant on submissions unless we have a guest editor mm -hmm. or a theme issue or a call for papers or something. So, so just the fact that whatever comes in from the field is really what determines what is published when it's of suitable, suitable quality. Mm -hmm. But uh, we do try and orient it a little bit. And Patrick and I are thinking of doing calls for papers on, on topics more. But, yeah. but, I guess in the but do you think that there is a greater overlap With between rethinking history. history on the one hand and uh, uh, history and theory than there would be between the journal of philosophy history and uh, history and theory? Or to put it simply, would you be standing uh, closer to history and theory than the general philosophy? I think we have uh, more similar interests still with history and theory, but they have been making noises that uh, they're not very interested in this discussion of narrative anymore, either, which is still one of the things which I, I expect to continue, because that's what we mainly get for rethinking history. So, I, I, 
think the profile of uh, the general philosophy of history is, uh, as you said, much more strictly philosophical than the others. And uh, we don't get very many submissions along those lines at all. So more of what we get is cultural theory, looking at phenomena in, in, in sort of a real world popular culture and then theorizing those without this very strong theoretical orientation, which seems to run through your submissions much more strongly. So I, I would say we are in that sense closer to yeah, the history of theory. So. But, uh, and maybe another that's thing that's you do that the other journalists don't is that you publish this kind of autobiographical essays by philosophers of history and they also mm. publish interviews that's with really, philosophers. It's yeah, a kind yeah, yeah. of self-reflection of the appeal that is probably your strong point in a that's, way. That's very good you mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have this, I don't know, you must have noticed, invitation for historian slot to ask uh, historians just to write about their personal autobiographical mm -hmm. experiences. What leads them to think that way about yeah. history? I yeah. think it's actually, Which is a well, nice I want to get a new uh, issue of uh, we think this is the first thing I read always. It is always interesting, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, true. That's very human. That's a human interest true. in this. Yeah, true. We, we do intend to continue that. The other thing we're now trying to get going is just to have, because we, we've had a feeling about the field in general that it's too focused on English language speakers and, Eng and the English language world. So one thing we're trying re to really do is bring in at least review articles of what's going on in other regions and other languages just to have an idea, but that has started, started off very slowly, so if anyone is interested in doing anything along those lines, please write to me. I think we'll even come back to this <coughs> yeah, yeah. future yeah. ideas. Then, Dioni, what could you add? First of all, I mean, Frank mentioned five journals. Is it, is it, is it complete overview, or was it missing something? And, and, and then, of course, how you see your relations in regard to those other journals, and etc. Um, I don't think he's missing anything. Of course, once you ask this question, I, um, one open question would be the relation to philosophy journals in general. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so are we going perhaps closer there or not? And uh, that's something that I have been thinking about a little bit. And I don't have an answer yet, but I don't think Frank is missing anything about the field. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are then... Uh, conference proceedings and others that produce same kind of stuff as well, mm -hmm. as, as we are planning to make out of this conference. Um, but can I comment on the general yeah, yeah. how... And also, actually, maybe an extra question uh, for you, especially because I'm, you come very much also from the field of the philosophy of science. And to, uh, how do you relate, I mean, in a way, yeah. philosophy of history is also a kind of philosophy of science, at yeah. least uh, from a certain perspective. I mean, how do you relate yeah. in this regard yeah. to the other journals of philosophy sciences? Okay, I, I, before that, I, yeah. I, I'd say that we started talking about this transition in 2015. <coughs> uh, we exchanged emails, and there were some other people also involved. And uh, now, when Frank said that he had been interested, he has been always interested in, in purely philosophical questions, issues about uh, history of writing. So I think I share that vision. Largely, I'm also interested in philosophical, i.e., conceptual questions about historiography, not only about writing but also research. So I think we uh, share that vision, and also what Carla said about rethinking history sounds familiar to me. I think you are doing more stuff that is more relevant to cultural studies, cultural reflection, perhaps, than we are. Coming back to the question about the relationship to the philosophy of science, yes, I have background there as well and uh, one of the suggestions to me after already a year ago or something like that was to bring in also papers about the historiography of science so that is a new addition so we are there isn't currently a journal international journal that would be publishing about philosophy of historiography of science so that has been added to the scope and those submissions are very welcome to so kind of trap that, that that space as well. Maybe a kind of naive question to end this first round of, of discussion. Do you feel that we have enough journals in our field or, or too much or, or, or is something missing or is, is, is it a perfect situation? How do you see it? when we're describing this landscape of, of the journals in our field? Is it ideal situation? <coughs> well, maybe. Uh, I think that the history of historical writing is a very important topic. 
of course, that was taken care of in uh, Studio della Stereograph, Stereograph, yeah. <coughs> but um, uh, Studio della Stereographia is, as you probably know, a shoot off of the, uh, of the bureau, mm -hmm. of the SIS bureau, and uh, it does, because of this, a lot of other things. Uh, so also what happens in the SIS bureau at, uh, at these large conferences, etc. Uh, and therefore is not exclusively dealing with the history of historical writing. And I think that a journal that does only this, uh, and if it does so in a very well-considered way, thinking always in what way these articles they publish might have their upshot or their importance for what happens, for example, in, in uh, history and theory or in the Journal of Philosophy History, that then such a journal that there would still be a niche for someone like that. So, okay. uh, or the other possibility would be, of course, <coughs> that the editors of uh, uh, the Studio della Storiografia, so Tartarolo and uh, the other person who does it, that they would take the initiative, and uh, which still is, well, presently a rather modest publication, work it out into something more comprehensive. and. Uh, uh, in English, preferably, exclusively in English, yeah. and that in that case, uh, well, this lacuna could be filled. Yeah. Do you have any reactions on the lacks or, or, or plentiness of the field? Plentiness of the field. I mean, is, is, do we have it? too much, too many journals in the field, or, or a few missing? In, if this is a field, no, yeah. we don't. I don't <laughs> think. I think. <laughs> That's, this, is good, uh, that's this is even a good number, and uh, we okay. need to get this field moving forward, and, and uh, we need some venues. So. Okay. I'm not sure. Can I just jump in? Yeah. Uh, I think we have two journals we should mention as well: the Brazilian one, Historia da Historiografia, mm -hmm. and then Historia in Historia Greece. In They're both, I mean, significant <laughs> also. I think in our fields. So yeah. Just yeah. not to forget yeah. these. Indeed. Ooh, and uh, right. about the size of the field, I I might want to disagree. I think we have. You know, in terms of how many people are working on this, I think we have enough journals. And in terms of uh, you know the percentage of theory of history journals, as opposed to how much is published academically, it's like one one hundred one hundred percent of the academic research being published in journals is theory of history. If you count up how many articles come out, and that makes this a big field already. I mean, you have natural sciences and everything in that. So I think I think we have to keep that in mind, and then be critical about the pressures coming, economic pressures coming, and the pressures for people <coughs> to publish, because this is kind of spiraling out of hand. Everyone has to publish something all the time. Definitely. And uh, I, I yeah, want to be critical so about that. Just, just the reaction on that. <coughs> when we're talking about the field, this field, it's a good question whether this is a field, or what kind of field is it, or whether it has any, or what kind of foundational principles it might have, or, or uh, the similarities. And my impression since I've been following maybe two years the flow of submissions and discussion first as just in the sidelines and then uh, now as an editor is my impression that this field is very diverse so really the diversity of the types of submissions mm -hmm. and about the topics they write that has really struck me uh, there are some Submissions deal with the history of philosophy, all the big names, Kant, Hume, Karamer, Collingwood. Some are somehow ethically inspired, politically motivated perhaps. Some are literary type of, we get also not many, but some of like that type. Uh, some rely clearly on analytic tradition, theories of reference or counterfactually to visit reference. Uh, others are pragmatist inspired and so on. And also, I think, stylistically, they are very different. You have essayist style, and then you have a more maybe analytic style. Um, so I would summarize my impression that, extracting a little bit, there is no paradigm in the field at the moment. Mm -hmm. Of course, the paradigm wouldn't be a fitting term either, according to Kuhn, but let's use it loosely. Mm -hmm. And the question is, do we need, do we want to have a paradigm? Mm -hmm. Okay, then uh, 
let's move on and the second point I want to discuss is actually the very relevance of the role of the journals in the kind of scientific communication in our field, let's use it loosely then, because as we know in certain fields, especially natural sciences, art is the main form of scientific communication, but in humanities at least it used to be rather a book or eventually an edited volume, and so again seen from inside perspective, how do you feel? Is this, again, field <coughs> uh, in brackets shaped and defined by the journals, or rather by the books, by the publishers? Uh, and, and also, how do you see the, this, yeah, this role of journals in the scientific communication in our field? Frank? Uh, well, I, feel, I would say that uh, <coughs> the editors of a journal have essentially two tasks. In the first place, they should uh, take care that the readers of the journal can have a good idea of, all, of everything that happens in the field, mm -hmm. so that you should select those quality submissions that uh, uh, are representative for all, well, well, all the dimensions of all the aspects of the kind of philosophy of history or reflection on history that you wish to cover in the journal, but, and that's for me very important, has been for me very important from the beginning, I have also had, always had an agenda. I wanted certain things to do with the journal. In my case it was that I wanted to restore the contact between philosophy history and philosophy in general. I have always felt very badly and very much disappointed about the fact that philosophy in general tend to avoid philosophy history like the best. <laughs> uh, Arthur Dento has written a, f a few funny things about it. And maybe you know, you know this anecdote? Yeah. Go ahead, because maybe the other yeah. side. Well, it was something like this, that uh, uh, when uh, I had a talk with, with Dento and then he said to me, uh, well, still people now doing philosophy history is very much liking encountering a Japanese soldier in New Guinea in 1965, not having heard that the war is over. <laughs> uh, and this had, well, we started to talk about it, it had to do with Dento's own disappointment about his analytical philosophy of history. For he wrote it was, as, as you probably know, of a trilogy, it was part of a trilogy. He had uh, the first, the analytical philosophy of knowledge, then he had the analytical philosophy of action, and then the analytical philosophy of history. He got a whole lot of reactions to the first two books, but nobody cares about the book of the analytical philosophy of, uh, of, of history. So he concluded that apparently this was a, a, a dead duck philosophy of history, and that's why one of the reasons was that why he started to do uh, mostly art philosophy. <laughs> uh, and I, I reviewed that book and I entitled the review Philosophy of History Banzai. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it. Yeah, he, 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 just, he got too close to Andy Warhol. <laughs> and he was so successful and he got out of Colombia and he was like going in the high society of New York art dealing and, and, yeah, yeah. and he just uh, so it, it, it wasn't just, you know, philosophy of history, it was just that way. Oh, this, yes. I mean, good for him. I mean, I wish I, I yeah. could hang around <laughs> Andy Warhol and look down at, at the, yeah. uh, the academics. But and then, I then, tried, it didn't work. And then, so. then the peculiar fact is he wrote one book on philosophy of history, which is even better than, uh, than uh, <laughs> uh, analytical philosophy of history, namely his. Uh, uh, the configuration of the commonplace. This is what I regard as his, uh, uh, as his major attribution to philosophy history. But um, this played, played an enormous, uh, a very important role that, uh, uh, yeah, that's in the Anglo-Saxon climate, in the uh, second half of the 20th century, uh, philosophy history was simply not was simply disregarded. You had people like McIntyre, people like, uh, like Hacking, people working 
well, as, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as Joni has shown, working on the history of science. And then you say, what if, if you say you write about the history of science, you should, well, a, ring, a bell should ring, I think, what is history? <laughs> no, no, they didn't care about history, that's just history. And then what they came out about, people like Latour, etc., was the most positivistic, primitive kind of history that you could think of. And this irritated me profoundly. So I said, why do these dumb philosophers, Anglo, <coughs> dumb Anglo philosophers of, uh, well, of language, etc., of science, not listen to what philosophers of history might have to tell them? So that was more or less my agenda with the journal, trying to re-establish the contact between philosophy of history on the one hand and philosophy and to make clear to uh, philosophers of language or science what they might learn if they had ears to hear what they could learn from philosophy of history. Yes, that's what I think Avi called the histor historical parochialism, I think this, that, that's kind of characteristic for philosophers because I mean, you probably have to conclude that after 10 years of efforts it's not really a success story. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Anyhow, the, the wall is too thick. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, for instance, I mean, uh, Carla has published a lot of articles in various uh, outlets. But now you 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 gathered them into a volume. Is it is it is it how do you consider it? Is it is it, uh, is it the monograph? Uh, it is. Is yes. it? Uh, uh, it is very much. Um, I mean, I was going to say to your question. I think okay. for historians, books are still the main thing. Monograph, so mm -hmm. I've never had very much uh, readers for my articles. I might have, you know, ten readers for the book, which would be an overwhelming success. I think. <laughs> <laughs> but then, so this, why do you invest? The, why do you invest so much of your time then into editing a journal while you consider that actually important things happen? Uh, in, I think in the volumes, I think books, books are what set the tone because books are what historians still prefer to reference. It's really strange when you, you get an article uh, draft, for example, it might have references to to articles. But then in the final version, they try to change as many to references to books for some reason, for the same author, instead of quoting where they first read this. And this is something that systematically, I think, repeats with historians when they're <laughs> finalizing their manuscripts. And I find that very interesting, that uh, the book is somehow much more valuable, especially in a bibliography when you're quoting someone. And, uh, okay. Well, this is just a personal experience, but I, I have noticed that strongly. So. I think also probably you only has the similar experience that you have been writing on those kind of things <coughs> for a few years, but when you came out with this book, post narrativist uh, philosophy, then suddenly some kind of uh, became so important and 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 uh, topic of various discussions. So what would you say? Well, yeah, I don't know if it became important, but yes, it has got attention, and I'm very pleased about that. Mm -hmm. and I don't know exactly why it's hard for me to analyze this. Is it, I don't think it's the, well, it's the book form that mm -hmm. explains part of it for sure. And maybe, maybe the, some conceptualists who like post-narrativism has got eye of lots of people. Mm -hmm. but, but then my question remains, why do we publish journals and articles when we actually realize that books count? <laughs> the article form is perfect. I think. I mean, you can say the same thing in an article form, you, but you don't have to go through all the extra stages. You just have the argument. But I that's guess just my two guns. I guess they're, uh, yeah, they're you're exclusive. Yeah. I think articles count as well. Okay. But only not all of them as much mm. as some others. But yes, they are important. Okay, Frank. I, I think the journals are the cement in the discipline. Yeah. They keep things together. If yeah. you have only that's books, true. you have only bricks, so to speak, and then the wall might crumble. Yeah. And it's the, art, the, 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 the articles in the journals that keep the wall uh, substantive and, and, uh, and strong. Yeah. Probably also journals are kind, kind of laboratories or workshops that actually can test yeah. new ideas, can feedback before, because if you spend like three years of your life writing a monograph, it turns out to be nonsense. It's a waste of time while you test, write a short article, get first feedback, and then change the topic eventually. Mm. Well, okay, you well, I was just saying that obviously I think people still read articles and at least they <laughs> want the articles to be published. And then when you are given this role, there's some power, maybe not a lot of power, but some power to determine what goes in, what goes out. And then comes responsibility with that, of course. So there is a chance to, so why to do this job, there's a chance to influence the 
field. <coughs> there is a field. You wanted to say about color? No, 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 no. Okay, Frank. <coughs> yes, I think there's one other a specific task for a task for journals that books could not uh, uh, could not take over for them. And this is this, the, the, the special issues. Mm -hmm. And that works in this way that uh, <coughs> one of the fantastic things of being the editor of a journal is that you have a wonderful survey of what happens in the field. You get a whole lot of submissions from all different sites. Uh, you can compare them with each other and you have, well, a vague idea of in what direction the discipline drifts, what will be the future there, and also of what might be there the main problems and the main topics of this discussion in the near future. And this might get the uh, editorial panel come to an idea, let's devote a, a um, special issue to topic X or Y to uh, focus all attention on that mm -hmm. because we expect this has the future in one way or another and then it may provoke mm -hmm. and help discussion forward in this direction mm -hmm. that we foresee will be uh, go will play a certain role in the future. Mm -hmm. Indeed, yeah. But could you uh, uh, Frank admit that some I don't know, an uh, article, a special issue uh, in Journal of Philosophy History has forced you to revise your own agenda, your own uh, take on philosophy of history. Or, uh, I mean, just because I mean, as, as we're talking about this influence of, of articles, yeah. would you say that as you have published some articles in the journal that have forced you to, to, to change or revise some of your opinions, philosophical opinions? You mean whether uh, well, I published things in the journal, and that somebody else reacted to it. And that yes, by, the, by the text in the, itself, you read an, you, somebody submits an article. Yeah, yeah. And you read it. Oh, and 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 that's brilliant. Yeah. Oh, well, yes. And and happens. I have to that have happens. to. That happens all the time. Oh, it's it's. Uh, uh, you learn a whole lot of uh, of okay. your own discipline. To the I point to change your own. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And especially since it's. Uh, yeah, if you work on a book only, it's only just a book and all that is related to this. So you have a very narrow scope. But when you are the uh, editor of a journal, mm -hmm. you get submissions on this, submissions on that. And also, well, you get a kind of idea of how all these things hang together. And that undoubtedly that, uh, uh, directly influences your own perception of what goes on in the field. I have learned a lot of, uh, well, these 10 years. So it's a rewarding uh, <laughs> uh, Probably maybe already kind of provoke some questions from the audience because you know, a lot of people with various experiences in publishing <coughs> either journals or monographs or edited volumes. Is there any comment you would like to make? Well, Alan. well you know, one great, one great thing about articles yeah. is that these days, they're actually the material in articles is generally speaking more findable than what's in books. At least at this stage in the development of the of the electronic distribution of scholarly material, and and I find that's great. I mean, uh, it's it's actually easier usually to find stuff in articles. That is to say, at least if you have, if you were connected to a university, so you don't have to fire well, than it is to find stuff in, in books. And I think that's quite advantageous. Could be indeed. Jonathan? Uh, I would say that this article, uh, book uh, comparison, is, and the fact that uh, you know, but that said that the references were changed from articles to books, it's it's more likely because of the prestige of the book and not necessarily because people actually read it, because actually nobody reads books, not from cover to cover, mm. not at all. But even just like, even if you read two chapters from one book, that's already like overdoing something. Because generally speaking, people seriously read introduction conclusion. That's it. Unless it is super relevant for them. And uh, when it comes to articles, I actually even feel that it's too long. I don't, I don't really need 10,000 words to state my point. And I'm really struggling 
to say a lot of irrelevant things that I actually don't want to say in order to make a, you know, the publishable material. And there are actually a lot of journals, not in our field, and especially, I mean, in philosophy, just like 50 years ago, you could pretty much publish these four and five thousand word uh, articles, and you could make the, the, you know, you know, you could argue for one point. And now people still arguing for one point in articles, 10 to 15,000 words. This is ridiculous, actually. And it's, it's just nobody wants to read those things. Or you go for you make a lot of points in one article, but then uh, then it's very demanding for the readers, and then the readers will complain that it's you know I just cannot follow so many things in one article. So it is it is actually a very very difficult issue, and especially from the point of view not necessarily for the editor, but from the point of view when you decide to submit to which journal, what kind of format, and so on. So. But I just want to say that even the article format can look very restrictive from the authorial point of view. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, the question is very loaded because we are, in the contemporary academia, we are forced to publish, I mean, publish or perish. And, and that's actually my concern that we might not have enough time to write monographs because we have to justify ourselves by producing many articles per year. And that's, of course, also what Kalle pointed out, actually, there is an increasing demand because there's more and more people who have to justify themselves instead of, you know, thinking and reading. They just have to publish somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And so we, I think we have to admit that the, uh, many submissions we receive actually are not that well worked through, uh, kind of draft versions, because of this kind of pressure. Yeah. Well, maybe a solution to the problem would be that uh, 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 editors, uh, and then I mean uh, the, the publishers, the, so the publishing companies, uh, would be easier with allowing uh, people who have published a journal in one of the articles to take it up in a book. So that they can say, well, I have now published chapter one in, uh, in, uh, in this journal, and uh, that's when he has come to chapter five, the last chapter, then you can just take all these five chapters together and then uh, publish the book. But nowadays, well, what I've understood as well, that would be the, uh, the counterpart of it all, is that uh, book publishers, and at least in the United States, United States uh, University libraries, are not very happy anymore to publish books that are, um, uh, well, uh, combinations of uh, previously published uh, articles. Okay. It sometimes happens, but for example, I think that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Chicago University Press doesn't do it anymore, that uh, uh, some uh, California University Press don't do it anymore. Okay. And then, yeah, then, then you're in trouble, of course. Indeed. indeed. <laughs> As my friends, just to give another example of these articles, turned into monograph is El Corunia's book, Moved mm -hmm. by the Past. I mean, he has been publishing various articles in different outlets, mostly in the history of theory still, but I think he really caught readership when he gathered all those pieces into one volume and probably discovered himself to his surprise. Actually, it makes an argument. Uh, and and I again, I would say that monograph is a much more kind of powerful uh, way of, of, of communication mm -hmm. than these different kind of articles. But are you Okay. Is it possible to ask you a question? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. Okay, go ahead. So, are you you actually worried about the future and role of books? Even though it's with books that you can make a name. That's it. Yeah, in a way. So that's a yeah, but paradoxical. I'm worried because I mean, um, it is my impression that somehow we all, yeah, we are uh, let's say partners in crime uh, in this mm -hmm. kind of publisher perish industry. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so my question, actually, I don't have an answer, but I think oh, yeah. we have to reflect how to encourage people also to keep writing monographs instead of uh, making only these article submissions. Yeah. And, and, and that's uh, probably, uh, yeah, I don't have an answer, but yeah. I feel that there is something in... I have a very pragmatic answer for you. Yeah? Just, at least in the States, junior faculty, in order to get tenure, have to publish a monograph. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's impossible to that's get true. tenure without that. But normally the book is, is a dissertation, but you can rework dissertation yeah, but you still have to go through the process. 
Yeah, you know, and that can take years. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and you won't, I mean, it's not just to get tenure, but even to get interviews, actually, for yeah, tenure yeah. track position jobs. You have to either be under contract or you have to, you know, I mean, so. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, but that's, that's very good, uh, US system, but it doesn't work. Uh, everywhere else, uh, but, but I think I, you, you I, have I, a point. I don't you? think that's necessarily a good thing. It's, yeah, okay. it's just because you have a gun to your head you know, the entire time. But, but that's the reality of it. Okay, so. okay. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, I speak only for myself. The, the writing and publishing of articles has, has um, uh, if I'd had the opportunity to publish a book three years ago, I should never, I should not have been allowed. If in writing five years ago, in writing and publishing articles, I, I have to move slowly. I have to to uh, uh, really uh, defend an argument, or defend an idea, all the way around. Come into a fairly small bore, uh, though, though you can enrich it and deepen it if, if you're skilled, but really defend it all the way around. It's not a waste of words to go to 5,000 or 10,000 words, because uh, it's not just what I want to say, to say it as quickly as I can in my own way, just for myself. It's to really think it through, to, 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 to work it all the way through and defend it. And what I then produce has not only educated me, but uh, for those who read it, <coughs> they get to think it through as well, carefully, and to see where it's weak and where it stretches and what, what protects it and where it's vulnerable. Um, and then when one, produ one produces a book, it's a much better book, which in my experience lots of people read. I don't find it at all credible that, 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 that people don't read books anymore. Um, so there's something about the um, Intensity of, of, of writing articles that's that's uh, stimulates one's development a great deal, and of course we also know individual articles have become quite famous and, and very influential just on their own. And as Alan pointed out, not only are articles easily accessible and immediately deliverable to you, uh, but there you can also word search the giant uh, whole journals, thousands of articles. So they're they're extremely. Um, it, 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 it's easy to, to as, as a researcher, to connect with lots of thoughtful words. Of course, it's not thoughtful, but to connect with lots of thoughtful words. Okay, now actually I wanted to mm, raise a third point, namely, what does it mean in practical terms to make a, a journal? Uh, and, and I don't know, maybe it's, it's not that interesting, but probably it might be uh, interesting for, at least for the younger colleagues here. Yeah. And, and of course... Uh, <laughs> It is actually quite time-consuming and 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 and, uh, and uh, very practical thing to do a journal. For instance, uh, finding uh, reviewers, finding uh, reading manuscripts, uh, rejecting, etc. So maybe I don't have even a very specific question, but but uh, you have all have been involved in this making process. What would you point out and and and? Um, would you like reveal some secrets uh, how to get published in your journals uh, or things like this? <coughs> how, how, how was it organized? Of course, it's changing because I think, Frank, when you started the journal, it was different than it is now when it's highly sort of uh, uh, mechanized, let's say. Oh. Well, I wouldn't say so. Uh, I wouldn't know, at least. Uh, uh, I can only tell you how I see it. Uh, yeah. It was lovely like this. Uh, right, you get a submission. <coughs> By email or by kind of by yeah by email, mm -hmm. and then I uh, started to read it very carefully, mm -hmm. and then I asked myself one preliminary question: Is this nonsense? <laughs> and is this wholly out of scope? Okay. And if it was either nonsense or out of scope, then I rejected it right off hand without consulting the other editors. So, okay. uh, when I thought it was not nonsense and it was not out of scope and that uh, it had the possibility of, well, in, in the end, perhaps being published. Uh, then I sent it out to the uh, other editors on the panel, and uh, I gave a rough idea of what is in the journal, what I hold myself to be strong and weak in it, and I asked them the question, shall we go on with it? And shall we go on with it? That meant, uh, in concreto, shall we send it out to external referees. Mm -hmm. uh, I should add to this that I think that each uh, self-respecting journal should make use of the double-blind peer review mm -hmm. and therefore send out uh, the submissions that they get to two to three external peer reviews and uh, who do not know the name of the author 
they get back the reports in due time and uh, well that's basically to the next uh, stage from when you have the reports of the uh, external uh, of the external referees and uh, well on the basis of this the uh, editorial panel makes up its mind about publication or not and then there are mainly three possibilities uh, it's uh, uh, rejected because, well, for example, all three of the reports are negative and say that uh, the essay is beyond retrieval. Uh, the second possibility is that they say, well, in principle, this could be a publishable essay, but it is not as yet. So then you get the so called rewrite and resubmit option. So then it is sent back to the author. Uh, together with the full reports and then he's asked to um, change his articles in agreement with the suggestions of the two to three referees. Mm -hmm. And then the last possibility is that the three um, uh, referees <coughs> find only minor errors or shortcomings in the article and then you say well it's, it's accepted for publication but on the condition that you repair these things that uh, mm -hmm. the uh, that the uh, uh, that the uh, referees have uh, discovered in your piece and then you know, sometime later then you get the uh, uh, the revised version then you look as an editor that's what I also did them whether they have lived up to the to the promises and uh, uh, um, introduce these changes and if so, well, that could go to the publisher and it could be put online afterwards. Okay, do you remember, for instance, over the last 10 years, what was the uh, rejection uh, rate or how many submissions you accepted for publications, how many you rejected, kind of roughly? Well, I would think well, roughly 50, 50 to 60 rejected and 40 that were published. Uh, okay. With, of course, uh, the balance between uh, rewrite and resubmit mm -hmm, and yeah. uh, accept it under certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe, maybe Kalle, what about your experiences? How it, how it works in Radio Thinking History? Um, very much the same. We don't send it out to the editorial board in between. And uh, Patrick and I have, uh, I mean, before sending to peer review, um, Patrick and I have had a long discussion now about being more firm with desk rejections, not just nonsense or irrelevant, but also if. You get a shoddy article, which they haven't even. We get a lot of articles where the author hasn't even put the effort in to actually finish it properly. Then we sometimes just send it back and say, "This is, you know, you might want to try again if you actually want to put the work in." But otherwise, you know, we're not going to mm -hmm. send it out because referees. It's such a small field again. Referees work for free. You don't want to put all that work in when the p person sending the submission isn't doing work. So, but so maybe no, that's, you, that's, that is, yeah. uh, I think for us it's a problem. That's uh, well because we are doing uh, well, a lot of history in the real philosophical sense. That I must confess that we receive a lot of com uh, of submissions, uh, of which I must honestly say that I'm insufficient an expert to decide whether this one is well uh, uh, up to the standard or not. So, um, and that's also true. Sometimes we get in. But none of the, well, we were done with four, four editors, and that none of the editors, for example, you get a <coughs> submission on Chinese philosophy history. None of us has any idea of Chinese philosophy history. So <coughs> then we send it to someone in China with the very funny name of Ivanhoe, <laughs> and he is a very good scholar. Okay. And then Ivanhoe tells us, well, I should publish it all rubbish, put it in a in the dust, uh, dust okay. bin. But actually, this, before I give the floor to, to, to Yoni, uh, because I remember you have mentioned, Frank, that you have never had problems in finding referees. No, uh, no, uh, no. But what about, what about reading the history? Because, I'm, because you mentioned, and this is actually very important, all people in the system actually work for free, uh, except the publisher who, who gain all the money. Uh, but, mm. but how does it work? I mean, and do you see any, any kind of problems there? I, I am wary about, I mean, we've got, at the moment, because we're just moving into this uh, 
editorial management system online, so we've got a very small reviewer database there at the moment. So I'm wary of troubling people too often, and in that mm -hmm. case, I, you know, I will contact new people. Most people will say yes, which is, I mean, bless them, but uh, but it's, it's, it's a lot of work. It's very easy to find people for mm -hmm. for ex external referees. Sure, of course. In the first place, you look at the uh, well at uh, the people mentioned in the article themselves. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know what it's about, and then it's just a matter of uh, uh, of looking on the internet, mm. yeah, and then yeah. you find this. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not saying it's a problem to find people to do it, but at the same time, to find motivation. Uh, the, the systemic problems, yeah. as you mentioned, the economic problems, it it, uh, mm. it does worry me that everyone is working with public money; it's going into private hands, mm. and uh, and we're just you know, people are working too hard for sometimes for very little reason. If the submission looks like it's in terms of quality, as you say, then that's fine. Well, I was if it's a topic I don't understand, then of course we'll send it to a reviewer. But uh. Well, I was all surprised by the ease with which people decide, said, oh, well, I'll send them a request. Uh, do you wish to review this, uh, <coughs> this paper? Then yeah. Almost even only a matter of days, I said, oh, I'm happy to yeah. do this. Yeah, most people do that. Yes. That's yeah. true. Okay, maybe so, you only can explain how it works now. Well, I, I don't need to run through the whole process. It's pretty yeah. much still the same as Frank described, except that it has indeed been systematized. There's the editorial manager software that uh, is a positive thing. It keeps everything in order and, you know, when they come, everything stays there, everything is stored, all these customs, all these systems, everything. So it helps a lot, otherwise my inbox would be a big, be a big mess. Uh, we don't at least I've been less than a year, there are no many desk rejections, only in the case when uh, papers are clearly out of scope, then it will be rejected. Otherwise, hasn't been actually any yet, as long as I've been in charge, and I guess my line is I'm observing what comes, reflecting the field, and then trying to give the advice to the author, even when it's rejected. Um, what's the, you asked some for instance, Tip, but what about your... How, your to, how to get it published? Uh, yes, and uh, does, uh, if you have any tips, but also, I mean, what's your, let's say, problems or, or solutions with the referees? Oh, right, yes. I, I don't have... I have problems. I don't have necessary solutions. Um, sometimes it's easy, but just people are different. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it comes in two days. That, in one day it has happened. <laughs> Other times, and this is more often the case, I have to go and look around and uh, some people don't never reply and then there are also rejections uh, mm -hmm. when I invite them to review. There are papers which uh, five or six reviewers have rejected an invitation and then it's a bit, a bit frustrating. Mm -hmm. So that's why sometimes the process is just longer, it's difficult to find them. And maybe in some specific areas of fields people reject more than in some others. What about the rethinking history? It takes time, yeah. Rejection rate, or what's the... I don't know. Have any clue? We have, we've just moved to the electronic system, yeah. and we don't have records from before. But what about and the queue, uh, let's say? For instance, uh, how, for how many years the, <laughs> the journal is already filled with new submissions? It's not... I mean, we are dealing a lot with special issues, theme issues. So mm -hmm. things will be slotted two years ahead, but then they'll always be in the general issues, usually. Okay. Still sort of issues being reviewed or revised and I mean uh, articles being reviewed or revised so you never know exactly what's going to happen there's always a little bit of okay. room to play around you want to um, say yo, yeah. I wanted to add something Go ahead, to what yeah. I said before and I, th I think it's important to say to all people that this is not a dictatorship so at every point when we judge to reject or accept or send out for review it will be discussed in our editorial poll. so all at any point of the system it will be discussed <coughs> And uh, <coughs> asked about rejection. Yeah. Um, I haven't counted, and I will do that. It seems that its rejection rate has been quite high recently, and the justification is just because the reviewers have been very critical, and then it's hard. You, you need a specific reason to go over them, walk over them. So we have been critical, but we, there's a, there's a long backlog, so maybe it's also. Uh, we can sustain and also explain the situation for the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have like 
roughly 20 minutes left and I propose we will discuss the last topic, namely the future. And, and of course we have this unique opportunity to brand new chief editors uh, in this panel. But also I would actually still like to start by uh, with Frank, namely I think we st when we started by describing this landscape there is at least five different uh, journals, maybe even more, uh, as, as Kalle uh, added two of them. Mm. What about the future cooperation between these journals? Because I mean, there is probably yeah, yeah. a lot of uh, a lot of uh, perspectives for for kind of you know even institutionalized cooperation. Mm. And, and do we have yeah. any 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 plans or ideas for this cooperation? Yes, that's a very sensible question. Actually, I've asked that myself, and actually I've gone as far as uh, trying to organize something like this. So I once wrote to Ethan Kleinberg and said, "Wouldn't it be chief a good idea?" Of Eastern theory. Yeah, the chief of the Eastern theory. And ask him, would it be a good idea to uh, be in contact with the five of us and perhaps a few other uh, journals that we can think of in order to uh, come to a kind of uh, defining ourselves with regard to each other uh, and uh, see also uh, what we all see as our um, uh, selling point, so to speak, uh, and so that we do not. Uh, work at cross purposes at each other's and that it's clear for the readers that if you have a subscription to uh, to uh, history then you may ex expect a different uh, kind of articles than if you uh, have a subscription to the story of della storiographia and that uh, the journal editors also uh, keep this into account and uh, for example, in such a very simple way, that if they receive a, reject, a, a submission that they wish to reject, decide to reject, that then they will say, well, send it to place X or to place X to, to place Y, something like that. Uh, and that you will do this also on a regular basis mm -hmm. and say how, so to speak, the, uh, <coughs> the policies of the, uh, of the five journals evolve and so that they are in agreement with each other one or more and do not um, enter into uh, an unpleasant and counterproductive uh, rivalry. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wrote this to, uh, to Ethan Kleinberg and he was most enthusiastic but uh, uh, I didn't hear from him, I reminded him somewhat later and neither did I hear something from him, but then I, it occurred to me that he probably thought, well, uh, well, we are the biggest and the largest and the most beautiful, <laughs> uh, so by making this kind of agreements with others, we will have to, uh, to give them something that we presently have, so we have nothing to win, to gain by this, so perhaps we should start with us. <laughs> And then uh, for this theory to cooperate with it, for otherwise, then the yeah, yeah, theory would have to fight against the four of us, and then they will lose. <laughs> yeah. So let's make a coalition here. Yeah. And, uh, but I think indeed uh, this is something that surprising that actually there is that little cooperation going on. But uh, but first, maybe you could react to this idea to, for cooperation. But, but uh, then also, maybe you would like to reveal some of your ideas for the future, where would you like to go, where, where, what, what, how you see the future you would like to shape with your uh, journals in our field? Am I the first? Am I the first? Okay, go ahead. Um, okay, I, this actually returns to the paradigm question, do we want to have a paradigm? So I thought the three points in this role I have, well, first is reflecting the flow, so I have to rely on the flow of submissions and see what comes. Then uh, necessarily some papers will be picked, some highlighted and then in this sense influenced the field. And then the third point would be hopefully somehow improving the field and the quality of writing and quality of writing about uh, philosophy of history. But then I'm torn between should it, this field become like to be aim of becoming more professional simply and that would mean more technical like in philosophy of language they can be debating about rigidity or vagueness or things like that. Should we have the same kind of development, have the conferences on 
on, let's say, purely on representation or or our, um, colligation or or uh, anything like that. And uh, perhaps, but then, when it's more diverse as it is now, maybe it's it's more it has more cultural uh, relevance, more cultural influence. So it would lose that side, lose a bit of that dynamism when it would become more professional and more qualitatively uh, with higher, um, with higher standards. Um, so I don't really know, but once reflecting on this, I thought, after all, this is an academic journal. It's not a popular journal. So we have to somehow aim at getting higher, getting more rigorous. And what I would like to see is basically this kind of conceptual recall, conceptual studies. Uh, but without any demands or restrictions on the background, philosophical background, where, wherever it comes, is it continental, or is it mm -hmm. what part of history, what part of region of the world? Uh, what about do we have any kind of formal uh, innovation in mind? For instance, to open new type of, uh, of sections or, or forums or I don't know short essays or, or have you? <coughs> um, we have discussed this, as you know, <laughs> so we have decided to be a bit more formal. We don't have any informal discussion pieces or any blog posts or anything like that. So there will be basically research articles, which is the main, mm -hmm. main thing, uh, longer review articles, short book reviews. <clears throat> and then in addition, one is there's three issues a year, so one is a special issue always, mm -hmm. guest edited. <coughs> and Finally, we have some forum debates on some yeah. specific debates, which is the different thing as uh, than a uh, specialist. Which is our kind of, kind of recent sort of invention in the journal of philosophy history. There not used to be that many forums uh, before. Then uh, what about what color? What about rethinking history? Ah, I'm trying to <laughs> think about where to start. So um, your vision for the next five years, please. <laughs> <laughs> We're still working on that very much. We're having a meeting with Patrick on Tuesday. So, <laughs> yes. so, so it's all in the planning. One thing we'd definitely do is continue with the creative writing in okay. some form or another, or expression, experimental history. And uh, I think we will begin to investigate more of the relation between theory of history and memory studies, because that's something which we don't want to go into memory studies, but somehow have a dialogue in that direction as well. And um, we will have continue to have calls for papers for theme issues, guest edited issues, at least one a year. And uh, I won't tell you the themes of the guest edited issue. issue oh, sorry, the calls for papers, you'll hear them at some point if you follow your emails. The thing I mentioned at the beginning, we'd like to have more broader geographical sort of coverage, so at least review articles of what's going on in different language fields, different areas, I mean, language areas, different parts of the world. And uh, also we've been planning to have a uh, section where we'd have translations of, or sort of translators of the sort of core pieces, maybe discussing the reception of the translation they've done. Let's say uh, <coughs> Philip Carr has recently translated Head and White into French, so perhaps he might or someone else would like to write a piece on the translation work and the uh, reception of that in a different language. This is one thing, and we've had, over the years always, we've had these miniatures yeah. and the invitations which you mentioned, so occasionally we'll have issues with just 3,000 word articles, so it's not always, as Zoltan said, this uh, long, boring article, we do have other versions as well, and uh, it, it is the dominant form, that's true, but it is, it's nice to break that form occasionally, I think. And we've been negotiating with Taylor Francis now because a lot of the people contributing would also like to work with video and the way that we can actually get video embedded into the articles because it's technically possible, but for some reason it's not academic to do this. So, okay. so we, we, you can have a link to a video, but you can't actually embed it into the PDFs yet or anything. So, so a lot of negotiations about these kinds of things. And uh, yeah, one thing I'm I'm also personally concerned about is go more back to this idea of. Uh, the reviewing process and how much we should be involved. We'd like to work more with, with contributors when the piece gets that kind of re review that it needs to be worked on. But at the same time, we wouldn't want to impose too much work on the reviewers because I think one problem with the current review process is that a revise and resubmit sometimes 
it's not the original work of the author after it comes back. It's more, you know, the work of the reviewers. And just to find a nice balance between this, to, to do it in a way where it's uh, <coughs> good for everyone would be something to work towards. Well, it's just to reveal some of our future plans in, more specifically. So there will be a forum debate on the history of computer science next year, based on a conference. And I hope to reach out for uh, historians and philosophers of science, audience who are reading like studies in history and philosophy of science. That's much, so far much bigger institutionally, more uh, embedded group of uh, scholars. Then there will be a special issue uh, about philosophy of Frank Ankersmith, uh, guest edited by Marek Tam. And Eugen Selinak. Eugen Selinak. And also it has been agreed to produce a special issue the following year about uh, pragmatism, mm -hmm. guest edited by Robert Pierce. So far, this. Okay, so some unpublished news. But that's the last chance to ask any questions. Okay, you can. About this idea of the videos. Do you perceive that there is a pressure to change academic writers about different points? If there is very few journals, you know, take the first step towards that to promote different forms of academic writing. I think rethinking history because that's been one of the main themes for 20 years. I think we have to do it, certainly. At least try to get into that somehow. But uh, there are some journals which have been doing that and the debates about it in America, they've been quite quite uh, negative when journals have tried to do this. They just, you know, have a video and nothing else. And, uh, apparently it just doesn't count as an academic work. Story of 40, wasn't it? <laughs> that was with photographs, yeah. yeah. yeah yeah, I wanted to ask, um, and this, this is touched on ever so briefly, but uh, have any of you considered a broader engagement with non-Western material? That is to say, uh, Islamic philosophy of history, Chinese philosophy of history, I mean, something like that. I would wonder what uh, uh, what kind of dialogue you can create and, and, and what kind of results or conversations can be had uh, by looking at different paradigms <coughs> completely um, well, for themselves, in themselves, but also in terms of we get submissions from these part of the world, so, and then uh, they are dealt with in the normal way. It's sent out to uh, experts, experts of course, uh, well, if it's from China, in China's historical writing, or when it comes from, well, let's say Kazakhstan or Turkey, <coughs> then to experts in Turkish history or historical of or historic, Turkish reflection on history, and so then it goes just the normal uh, procedures go as follows. But it's quite a proactive sort of... Yeah. So proactive. So something thematic, so for example, <coughs> uh, debates, I mean, some of the talks that we saw today, uh, phenomenology, right? I mean, so there are different concepts of phenomenology in uh, Chinese history, or if, if, if they have different uh, boundaries between science and philosophy, I mean, is this a conception that exists in Indian, uh, <coughs> in Indian science and in, philo in Indian philosophy, something like that? You know, so then you could have... Uh, as it happened today, we discussed reaching out to more globally, but that was more like in terms of getting people involved in, in some capacity. And but about a thematic issue about let's say Islamic philosophy or Chinese philosophy or something, I think I would be open to that. But then would need to be specified, so what is, is there specifically Islamic philosophy of history or from what perspective? It's, that, it's that not enough, geographical location is not enough to justify the special issue. But it's possible, and obviously we are <coughs> always looking for suggestions for special issues. So if someone comes up with a good idea mm -hmm. in relation to China or Islamic world or anything like that. A kind of comparative well, philosophy of history, yeah? yeah. Like global philosophy of history. We have, we have people working on it. Jörn Rusin is very much involved in this with China and uh, Ulrich de Makrag uh, is a big figure at the moment and, and they're working on that so hopefully they will come with special issue submissions at some point. But, uh, I, I, it's not a, something that people work very much on yet for some reason. Well, there's, there's a Chinese English yeah, yeah, there's an English language journal in China which is also publishing a lot but even they're trying to go, go the same route so they're talking about narrativism in white. And so on, and not less about their own stuff. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, something. Yeah, I was wondering if any of you plan to uh, abandon the uh, you know, print editions 
Uh -huh, okay. And then let's say to save that money for more interesting things in the budget. I could even maybe tell because it was in my list. What, what, what do, how do you see the digital future of, of your journals? <laughs> do you have any? I mean, uh, any, any, any. You also, if you like, would you have an opinion about open access kind of uh, approach yes, or what? <laughs> maybe it's too, too specific. I don't know. I, I don't have a specific. Okay. View, except that the impression that well, print issues will die out rather sooner than later. Yeah. And, but that, that's to do with the publishers, and I don't know what, what they be on this is. Well, I might have some access to long-range figures for the journal issue of ideas. And indeed, print goes down like this, yeah. and electronic goes oh. up, but it's slow, it's kind of slowing. Uh, one could imagine a, a journal has to, at least in theory, have one paper copy. <laughs> I mean, you know, just sort of, sort of theoretically, it's a paper journal. And you can do that, I mean, print on demand. Uh, I mean, qu quite so. I mean, a paper will not absolutely disappear. But I think there's some cachet in having a, a sort of big idea of, of the physical <laughs> I don't know. If Personally, I, I, I like, you know, the JHI, I, I like the physicality of, the, of, of, of that journal. Uh, but it's expensive. I mean, it's expensive. Mm. This is all look after themselves. I mean, yeah. As libraries continue to cut down on the number of papers, mm -hmm. uh, you'll, you'll, get, you'll get down to, I don't know, how many, how many physical copies. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I should say this, actually, but I, quite late, I asked the Brill, could you send some paper copies here that I could <laughs> give them out? It was probably too late, two weeks ago, or something like that. And they replied saying that, yes, on someone's desk, there's one, and there's another on someone else's desk. <laughs> so, so I got two copies. So there really isn't a stockpile of them, yeah. unless yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a need to, to, to print them. That seems to be there. But to follow up on Balthazar's comment, when, when they eliminate print, are they going to give you a bunch of money to do other things? Or is it going to be more profit than Braille and Taylor? Unlike. <laughs> <laughs> I think for, for rethinking history, I think we have 10 individual submissions, around 10, just under or below, and then the library. I mean, that's, print that's copies, so that's it. Um, and of course, then, of course, when it becomes uh, a bit digital, the very idea of special issue is also under question because people, like in music, people doesn't like CDs, but the labels, they just pick up songs. And I think the same will happen with articles. I mean, they just you know, take randomly those articles and they don't pay attention to this kind of composition of, of special issue. We, we already have this problem because we have a PDFs come out right away when they're finished, and then you know a special issue is collected sometimes a year later after the first articles appear online. Yeah. Is it difficult? How's that? Couple of natural sciences journals actually order the work on that basis, mm -hmm. and publish on that basis. It's not necessarily that it's not like we have four volumes per year mm -hmm. or something like that. Sorry, four issues per volume. Exactly. Yeah. Quarterly. Um, I mean, I would be so happy to say to your point to an actual example, but I just cannot. <coughs> but I encountered when I was trying to submit, about this is some articles and stuff, so I was looking out for a couple of natural science and journals, and then I actually encountered with these facts that they are, uh, they are much more advanced in what you think is the job of humanities in doing uh, you know, all these transitions. Yeah, yeah, more, yeah. more tend to be more conservative. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can report. I've actually published an article in a journal called Studies in the History and Philosophy of the Biological Sciences, and my article, but you know, other articles have the same same trajectory. My article came out, I think, in January of such and such a year, uh, in a preliminary version, and then it came out in a final version. And then the actual issue was only assembled about six months later. So there's, there's this odd feeling of it comes out the first time when it's ready, okay? But then it's actually things are introduced, as you only assembled together uh, mm -hmm. when it's uh, convenient. But sometimes if they don't assemble it anymore, if they don't have volumes, etc., they just publish article per article without paying attention how many articles they publish. All good stuff get published. 
Can't you don't have to count you know, how many issues, how many volumes, whatever. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to throw in here, I checked some of the data for this, and uh, publication lag on average for academic journals for one article is, the average is 30 months. So, it's good, perhaps, to get rid of paper issue. 30. 30. Yeah, yeah, which is it's just ridiculous. But about the open access fees, yeah. I want to sort of put in a word of protest, because at least the bigger, bigger publishers are going for these 2,000 euro open access fees if you want to go the gold route. And again, I just want to note that it is public money going to private hands, so it's something that yeah, you have I feel we should try and resist, but of course there's not much you can do about it if you're inside the systems. But you have also free open access, meaning that yeah, you yeah, have I mean, to Of pay. course, that, that yeah. sounds perfect to me. <laughs> so we would get only more resources if the subscriptions go up, so that the answer is okay. It doesn't hurt if you ask your libraries to subscribe to Journal of the Philosophy of History. <laughs> but yes, there's the problem that Kalle mentions that then it's the real and others who make a profit. Uh, of course, it's possible for an individual author to buy, right, <laughs> to, to make his, his article open access. Yeah. You only have to spend about three or four thousand dollars and you know, it's freely available. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But also the National <laughs> Research Councils are, are almost every <laughs> European country, they're factoring that money into their funding now. So yeah. people have to do that. Yeah, exactly. Don't know. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I want to say, Say something about about the issue that we discussed before, whether to whether to look for the novel forms or of uh, of, of writing or or, or uh, exchange of ideas, and I think that there is a reason to to try to do that. On on one side, of course, because of the pressure of publishing, we get a lot of demand for these uh, traditional forms of publishing articles and books. And and that's why we can continue doing that. But, but we have to remember that this is this is more for the people who, who publish themselves, to the to the authors. They they need that. Now, in order to enhance a dialogue, really, of of different ideas, I think that doesn't come that uh, that does that the situation with that has changed. And and it has changed in a, uh, in this sense that there are. There is so much more publishing venues each year, and there are so much more people who are publishing each year, and 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 the, and the number is growing all the time. Whereas the number of readers is not growing that fast at all. So to to compete for the attention, if we want to spread our ideas or or provoke a dialogue or something, to spread our ideas, we have to do something new. In, in this sense, it's. It's worthwhile to, to try some new 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 forms of literature ideas. Yeah, so Frank can wake up at six o'clock in the morning and tweet something about Paul Roth. <laughs> <laughs> then you get attention. <laughs> Even make a YouTube well, video. Ring a bell. I think Yelka wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to continue about open access and the idea of you know self promoting by the author. Uh, what is uh, your idea for us? Stands on the people you know, putting their paper on, let's say, Academia Yedu, either or somewhere where it's accessible to anyone. I know the publishing houses aren't happy about it, but in a sense, it's free, free promotion. Yeah, but that norm, I mean, if you if you read care carefully your your contracts, you're not allowed. Yeah, you're not allowed. But yeah. That's why I'm asking the editor, but not the publishing house. <laughs> I think they depend. I mean, they I don't know. Do have any, any policy yeah. toward <laughs> Academia dot Edu? Or are you more pro, pro of this openness of getting the material out to everyone? I, I personally, I've decided to be a good boy, and I, I do what the publishing houses ask you to do the final sort of before the proofing that version as a as a document of your own, and that's a good way. I think it's a good compromise, but it requires a little bit more work. And I know a lot of colleagues who just scan their books and put them on Academia Edu immediately, so I think it's up to the individual scholar. But uh, it would be nice well, that stuff thing was you read. you guys can do if you want to promote is, and I was surprised that it works, it's recorded. Uh, because, uh, you know, the companion that I published, uh, they didn't ask my permission or anything, they just recorded it and, and started selling the, the recording. And I thought, you know, who's crazy guy going to buy <laughs> You know, an encyclopedia and listen to it, 50 entries. You know, I didn't prepare it for anybody to read all 50 entries except myself. 
Uh, and and it, 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 it sounds great. Now, partly it's because I'm, I probably slightly misrepresented it in my description. I like really kind of upbeat, and then it got all these social media protests that, like, uh, John, I have to it. Not for the man from which omnibus? Clapham. 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 Right, so some, some frustrated Brit who thought, you know, he'll get the meaning of history and life. Uh, not for the man from the Clapham omnibus. Uh, uh, and, and, and some other guy, some, some lawyer from the American South, wrote that the, the, these people like to listen to themselves. Which is kind of ironic, a guy who bought to listen to me, thinks that I want to listen to myself, which I really don't. But anyway, it sells, it sells better, now it sells better than the, um, either the, the, the electronic or the paper wow. copy. Because, and I think it's because of people's lifestyle now. You know, they exercise, they go to the gym, they drive. The mm -hmm. moment they, they, and, and most academic articles, you can't listen to them. Um, so so it's, 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 it's a matter now. Of course, you can't buy an actor to do it. They, they, they pay an actor to do it. You know? uh, I, uh, uh, but, but, but if you have some, I mean, I know a couple of academics who have a good voice. And they recorded their own stuff and put it on YouTube or whatever, uh, so that people can listen to it. Uh, but if you get somebody, you know, some student or somebody who has a good, you know, Shakespearean voice, because you know, if you're looking to get, you know, your head above the crowd, that's something that most academic, you know, almost there are no recordings of academic articles. So if you do that. It gets a slight edge there. Interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll two points. First of all, I, I think actually that voice can be produced robotically now. Yeah? Yeah, so you don't have to do it's 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 not it's not the same. Well, because it doesn't have the right, you know, it doesn't change. Right, right, a, a real person doing it. Yeah. But I want to pick up the point that, that you made. Uh, about trying to get get more attention, I, I would like to put a plug in for uh, small forums within the two journals, uh, which would be uh, uh, maybe four mini articles of between 2,500 and 3,000 words on a single exciting theme. I, ideally, with one or two of those mini articles being written by some famous person. So you want a, a good theme famous person, uh, snappy titles, and those little for forums, and there was a forum in JHI on uh, information overload, uh, and, and the citation, the citations that that yeah. got, yeah. Was quite, it's quite fantastic. And, and I, I think you can get more citations to the journal by putting at least some effort into generating these small forums. They can, they can sometimes be produced out of mini-conferences. Yeah. Now they call it virtual special issues, actually, which are you know, made up of <coughs> pieces already published that somehow <coughs> thematically re reunited somehow. But, uh, to kind of use of your backlist somehow to make it active again. But uh, I think we have exhausted our time and uh, we will have the dinner in half past seven. So to leave enough time, we probably shall end now and hope to see you tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you.